I literally just built the first one because it was driving me nuts that I hadn't built it. Today we're in Chatsworth, California, checking out a restoration shop simply known as Icon. For lack of intelligent foresight or planning, it wasn't like I had this vision of what this brand is today. I saw people wanting you know, more and more drivability and modern functionality, but having less and less love for modern design and kind of yearning for the old ethics of design. Derelict started because I wanted uh, an old station wagon that wasn't over restored, that was fast as hell and fun to drive, that I could take my dogs or my kids to skate park or surfing and not worry about it. Right. And I was like, why do it stop? Just because that's the way it was done then doesn't mean we need to repeat mistakes. It's like you're gonna do a house, you may be respectful to the original aesthetic of that vintage house, but you're not gonna put horsehair insulation and uninsulated, you know, cloth braided wrapped wire and, and no AC. You're gonna want all that functionality, but the vintage aesthetic. So I kind of wanted basically to take an architectural approach to automotive design. So you've got a few different kind of variations with how you restore your cars. There's yep. reformer, derelict, and custom one-off. Well, I mean, kind of sort of production models being the FJ series, the BR, and the Thriftmaster TR. And then the one-offs kind of break into two divisions. You've got the derelicts, which are like, you know, the vintage patina looking as found, and then the reformers that are like concourse restored and redesigned. But the theme amongst everything is that old look and style, but then making classics work in modern life. The way we've grown and, and trained our crew is like two-man teams will build every vehicle start to finish. So there's like pride and ownership and retention. I started this car from the beginning. So this is a uh, 1954 DeSoto. What was like the original motor for this one that you found in here? Um, it, was a, it was a pan head, uh, inline six pan head. Nice, okay. So it was putting out, what, 100 oh. and something horsepower? Uh, yeah, it, it's pretty, pretty. I think it's like 80 or something. Oh man. I'm, I'm not a, positive, I mean, but it's pretty small. For a car this size, that's just like nothing. This is a 1977 Ford Bronco. Uh, we're in the final assembly stage now. Wow. Um, this whole car was pretty much taken apart from the ground up. Um, powder coated wow. the chassis, had to make some uh, minor arrangements to fit a new 5.0 Coyote motor that comes in a 2012 and up Mustangs. Wow, that thing's a hoss, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking of the chassis, you said this is the first Bronco with the stock chassis. Every other one of them is completely fabricated from scratch from like Art Morrison. Right. So this one is, this one's pretty much dead stock, right? Yeah, this it's is the a chassis. Correct, this is a dead stock chassis our first time fitting a 5.0 motor. What's the motor in here now? It looks, that's, uh, that thing's massive. Yeah, it's got a 6.1 liter Hemi in it, uh, naturally aspirated. So a Bronco is like two and a half year wait before we can even start on it. FJs are about a year, Thriftmasters about a year, and the one-offs are ranging two to four years, depending on the complexity. Everything underneath is completely new. Yeah, this got a whole different drive, it's a modern drivetrain compared to what used to be in them. Uh, Five-speed transmission now, with, they only came with the three-speed. Three right, yeah. Uh, you're going from 200 horsepower up to 400 plus with this engine. Wow. A common request is like, this is a 48 Buick. This client wants this to be daily driver friendly, so it's like almost 700 horse and six piston ABS brakes and all that niftiness, but everyone is so corrupted by navigation and touch screen and, and that. So like with the 40s cars, we'll take the original AM speaker and then my mechanical engineer will monkey it so we have the actuator. So it doesn't like jump the shark until you need that functionality. And these cars, like Jonathan wants them, although they're beautiful to look at, I mean, he wants them off-road, right? Like a lot of the customers take them off-road. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. We get clients that uh, send us pictures from Africa with the, uh, their car in the jungles and stuff. Yeah, oh my of, gosh. Yeah, they wow. use them. They wow, that's them. nice. This is our favorite FJ model, the FJ44. It's our top seller. 
and I can yak, yak, yak about how groovy and different they are and evolved from the originals, but it's all worthless unless you actually drive it and tell me what you think. So let's take this out. Let's go. Perfect. I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. I just created the FJ44 in response to customers. Specifically, I was on the phone with a client. His wife was over his shoulder looking at the website saying, no, no, no. Unless you can take all four kids out on the weekend and give me some peace and quiet, you're not buying another car. <laughs> Okay, so, then. So, Supply and demand. Totally. Yeah. So literally right then and there, I did like a South Park crappy quality Photoshop hack job render and stretched the bugger and emailed it to the guy. And the wife's like, okay, that'll work. So I just winged it and guessed what it was going to cost and figured if I lose money, I'll you know pave the road for a new model. And then serendipity has been my friend since day one because literally I think within like two weeks, we sold four more of it. So wow. that group of five covered all my non-recurring engineering costs to develop it. And then we introduced it, and since then it's been the most popular FJ model because it's, you know, you can seat six people, a lot more room for cargo. The only bummer, the switch out there, the trade-off is turning radius sucks. But the drive is so much nicer that I think it's fine unless you're planning on canyon crawling 90% of the time and then get a 40 and right. pack tight. With Icon, with the FJ, we used back then what was state-of-the-art ferro arm. So basically like you define magnets and then point by point by point, you seek to define and create the dimensions of that vehicle in the computers, like a big monstrous point cloud of data. Okay. So the idea was that way we'd be correct and, and original with the silhouette and the shape of the truck, but then we completely ignored the original design when it came to ergonomics dash, factored in the best climate control, for example, not what would fit, you know, and change the seating position to get everything factored much better. And like I had it all realized and in my head and it had just been driving me nuts. And that's like when I knew I had to build it. So I just built it and then when I was done, went back and added up what I'd done. I was like, oh, like no one's gonna tolerate this. But I-, I It was too far out there. Yeah, but, but you know much. what? I, I talked to people smarter than me and really, really good brand people. And they convinced me to like stick to my dreams, stick to my passions, my original vision. I wanted to build something I could really be proud of that was not without great sacrifices in the design. And then we just went for it. And then, you know, went into doing the 43s and all the other variations from there. Wow. And then as time's gone by, we've been really lucky because, you know, big companies that wouldn't come to me with my crappy low volume now come to us because of those ethics that we protected and defined with the brand and the brand reputation, which helps us, you know, make the product measurably better, you know, at every redesign juncture. So it's really been a wild ride. So focused on this one alone um, it is a made-up car FJ 44 yep now what is the power plant power plant on the FJ's all the FJ's we run uh, 5.7 LS's we run two different internals meaning cranks valves and valve springs so that you have either 370 or 420 horse and 390 or 450 horse wow. they're fuel injected we run the pulley driven accessory package from the Vortec trucks. So you have mechanical fan and fan clutch and you're you know, river crossing friendly versus electric fans. And we run the Vortec truck intake and injectors so we get a truck uh, torque curve. Okay. And then nice. the tranny, we either run a 4L65E GM automatic or an Ace and Warner five-speed manual. Wow. And then the transfer case is that twin stick situation which is the Atlas II, so it gives you shift on the fly control over front and rear axles. Right, high low. Yeah. yeah, and then you have locking diffs, so then you can lock power to all four wheels, front, left, rear, right, uh, or all four, or just rear two. When you hit the boulders. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the engine size is purely up to the customer, whatever they want. Yeah, I mean, basically it stays at a 5.7, and we give them That's choice standard. of internals. Okay. So it's a matter of what kind of horsepower capacity they want. Okay. But for us, packaging-wise, that way there's more consistency. It's the same motor footprint every time. Yeah, which saves you cost, but also can save the customer a lot. Yeah, totally. It's yeah. one of the f relatively efficient things that we could do versus like offering a supercharger where then all your engine packaging dynamics are going to be drastically different. All the engine components have to be different. You know, a supercharger, that changes the whole game. Whole different you know? deal. Yeah. 
150 more horsepower, that's... That's good fun. Yeah, that can blow some pistons. <laughs> So a lot of times, because automotive really has become more kind of price driven, not quality or longevity driven, right. I'll actually get into marine, aerospace, rail car, DOD, DARPA, military, architectural, because wow, okay. there's different priorities in design with them. And I find stuff like, you know, these AC vents are from uh, Cessna. These sun visors are on Learjet. The latches for the windshield frame are sub-zero latches from like uh, meat lockers. They've been made in Detroit since like 80 years ago. The, the textile on the seating is Chilowich, which is like for high-end, you know, outdoor patio furniture and placemats at restaurants. And that's the fun to me. That's a blast. Because not only does the quality get up, but if you keep an open mind, Everything is inspiration, like everything. Like on the Bronco, you notice we use that funky kind of matte reflective glass. Yeah. That's actually oh skyscraper God. glass. Oh my but then one of my clients works at Siemens and we're like, hey, what about automotive? So he was curious enough and wanted it on his truck that he worked with us, so we pioneered. He actually wet CNC architectural glass and then temper it and becomes automotive safety rating. But then the sky's the limit because you can get into all sorts of unique aesthetics and bronze tents, green tents, gray tents, charcoal, reflective, half clear, 30 clear, matte, like opens up a whole new world of options. It seems like you can almost, uh, when, when you don't take an automotive approach to it, you bring in everybody else and that's when the, that's when the ideas start to flow. And totally. You can actually it's like more of an architectural uh, architect's approach to transportation because right. really at its core, What's always fascinated me with trans is not only is it an extroverted platform, you get to share an experience in life and with people and family, but it's an incredible combination of arts. I mean, you've got woodworking and mechanical engineering, electrical engineers, so many different materials and surface. So what better platform to be able to play in all those different realms and figure out how to make them all work all together. Honestly, to me, it's about being passionate about what we do, about reviving American predominance in craftsmanship and design and sourcing and supporting American companies. And like, as long as I can protect that ethic, the sky's the limit, as I see it, you know? The brand then means something. So even if I only ever make a couple of them and there's never great volume, then at least in 50 years when somebody sees one, it says something that's important. Right. So yeah, I'd love to triple my output. Yeah, I'd love to do motorcycles, furniture, watches. Because the whole like vintage modern idea to me has such legs. I mean, it's endless oh, yeah. if you start thinking about it. Yeah, it so I'm just happy that we found enough people that tolerate the cost and the weight that allow me to keep doing what I'm doing. And I just want to keep running and doing more and more. in the back.